So now we're going to do the fiscal policy macroeconomics review. Before I get into all of this, I want to talk about just the basics of fiscal policy and then some important definitions that you need to make sure you have down. So the basics of fiscal policy is the government trying to fix a recession or inflation by changing their tax levels or their spending levels or both. So for example, in a recession, the government would use expansionary fiscal policy and they would fight the recession by increasing spending and decreasing taxes. Their goal is trying to increase the C of GDP. Contractionary fiscal policy is used to fight inflation. The government can fight inflation by raising taxes and decreasing spending and therefore decreasing the C of GDP. Now an important thing with expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy. In expansionary fiscal policy, if the government is spending more but collecting less in taxes, it's always going to create a budget deficit. So a deficit in expansionary policy is a very important term for what we're covering later. In contractionary fiscal policy, if the government is collecting more in taxes but spending less, they're going to have a budget surplus. So surplus is a very important key word for contractionary fiscal policy. Two terms you see on the AP exam pretty often and kind of can be tricky to know the definition of and the difference between are automatic stabilizers and discretionary fiscal policy. They're both types of fiscal policy, but one of them, automatic stabilizers, kick in when we enter a recession or we're fighting inflation without a single new law being passed. They automatically stabilize the economy. For example, in a recession, automatically unemployment compensation spending will increase because more people are unemployed, more people collect unemployment compensation, government spending goes up, expansionary fiscal policy without a single new law being passed. Or contractionary fiscal policy, automatic stabilizer, is our progressive tax system, where automatically, if there's inflation and we demand higher wages, people have to pay higher percentage of income taxes on those wages. Inflation, higher taxes, automatic fiscal policy without a single new law being passed. Discretionary is something new, something different, a change. So change is a great key word for discretionary fiscal policy. So if the government lowers tax rates, they change the policy or they increase spending or create a stimulus program, all of these things change the current policy and expansionary fiscal policy through changes are discretionary. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is the spending and tax multipliers. These are the different ways the government can increase GDP or decrease GDP with fiscal policy. And we're gonna look at how the government spending tool versus the tax tool of fiscal policy have slight differences in how they're calculated and how they then affect GDP. So looking at this, one thing to take into account is we measure at the margin, meaning of each additional dollar of income. So for each additional dollar of income, we look at how much a consumer um, spends of that income, MPC, marginal propensity to consume, and how much of that dollar a consumer saves, NPS, marginal propensity to save. So these two things always add up to equal one. And with the spending multiplier, what we're doing with this is calculating how much GDP can increase based on how much money consumers spend versus how much they save. So the formula is one over MPS or one over M1 minus MPC because as I said, those two add together to equal $1. It doesn't matter what they give you. So in this example problem, if government spending increases by $5 million and MPC is 0.75, we can calculate the change in GDP by saying the spending multiplier, which would be one over 0.25, since if MPC is 0.75, MPS has to equal 0.25 times the change in government spending of 5. So this would end up being 4 times 5, and I would say GDP would go up by $20 million as an expansionary fiscal policy example. A tax multiplier example I have here is the same idea, but it's dealing with the amount of money taken out of our income in taxes, which is why this formula is actually negative. So if it's dealing with the money taken out of our income in taxes and taxes go up, we're going to look at how much GDP in total will decrease by, which is still determine how much we consume and how much we save. So looking at the same example, but now with an increase in taxes, it would be negative 0.75 over 0.25, which equals negative 3 times by the change in taxes of 5, 
and I would say GDP would go down now by 15 million dollars. So what we notice is this is expansionary policy and GDP went up by 20. This is contractionary policy, GDP went down by 15. And this illustrates a very important point, that the spending multiplier is always larger than the tax multiplier. So we see the change in GDP is greater from the spending multiplier than the tax multiplier. So this is one way the government could maintain a balanced budget because you notice that they're increasing spending and taxes by the same amount, but still affect GDP. So an example is if the government wanted to increase GDP while maintaining a bu balanced budget, they could increase spending and taxes by the same amount because GDP will still end up increasing overall by $5 million. So it's expansionary fiscal policy while maintaining a balanced budget. So that is a spending in the tax multiplier. And remember again, the spending multiplier is always larger than the tax multiplier. And the real reason why for this, other than just the math, is because the tax multiplier has leakages out of it. Not all of the money the government takes from our money in taxes is used for fiscal policy. That money is also used for saving and borrowing, paying off debts or imports, all things that are leakages out of GDP. So because of that, because the government's not using all of that money for fiscal policy, this number is always smaller than the spending multiplier. The next thing I want to go into is the concept of crowding in and crowding out of gross private investment. So this concept goes hand in hand with the loanable funds market graph. The loanable funds market graph looks at how much borrowing and saving an economy is doing. And so we have the quantity of loanable funds and real interest rates. And whatever happens to borrowing and saving, borrowing moving demand, saving moving supply, affects the real interest rates. Now with borrowing, it's mostly talking about government borrowing, more borrowing, more demand. For example, in a deficit, they have to borrow more. Demand for loanable funds increases. Savings really, though, can be talking about any type of saving the government saving levels, consumers, producers, or the foreign sector. And the foreign sector is important because sometimes on the AP exam they say, for example, more countries are investing in the United States, show this change on the loanable fund market graph. You would say the supply of loanable funds would increase because if other countries are investing in us, America has more money to save. So foreign market always moves supply of loanable funds. If you keep that straight, it's not too hard. But we're going to be talking about specifically government borrowing and saving to illustrate the crowding out of gross private investment. And this is going to show the relationship between the real interest rate change here and gross private investment, the IG of GDP, because those real interest rates will connect across the graph. So with crowding out of gross private investment, this is a criticism of expansionary fiscal policy, specifically of expansionary fiscal policy. When the whole point is to grow GDP, the I component of GDP is going to end up being hurt. And there's two scenarios that we may see crowding out. It could affect the demand for loanable funds or the supply of loanable funds. So I'm going to show you both scenarios on this AP example. So with the first example, in a recession, the government increases spending and decreases taxes in order to grow GDP. But because of this, they end up creating a government budget deficit. Because of this deficit, the government is going to have to borrow more in order to fund the deficit, which would increase the demand for loanable funds. Or the government could save less in order to fund the deficit, which would decrease the supply of loanable funds. Either way, whether you're borrowing more or saving less, real interest rates are driven up. And if real interest rates are driven up, gross private investment, the I of GDP, is driven down, which is the opposite intended effect of expansionary fiscal policy. Not only that, classical economists say that this is the worst thing for the economy because not only does it hurt the IG, IG has a direct relationship to long-run economic growth. So if investment goes down, long-run economic growth is hurt, and classical economists are all about the long run. 
Keynesians are like, it's okay. It's okay if the I of GDP goes down, because if we focus on the C, and C is the largest component of GDP, the increase in C will be greater than the decrease in I. So GDP will still go up, we'll still be fighting the recession. It's okay. And also they say it's okay, because if the Federal Reserve also uses expansionary monetary policy, buying bonds, lowering the reserve requirement, discount rate, and federal funds rate, if they do that at the same time, they're focusing on increasing the eye of GDP and decreasing interest rates. And it can end up counteracting this problem here. So if the Fed uses expansionary at the same time, it could balance out, I could end up not being hurt as much or not hurt at all, and GDP will go up through the C. So they still use expansionary fiscal policy. Now another criticism of fiscal policy is the exact opposite, crowding in of gross private investment. So this is when we are using contractionary fiscal policy and it ends up helping IG when the whole point of contractionary fiscal policy is to decrease GDP to fight inflation. So we still have our side-by-side -side graphs with investment demand and loanable funds and comparing how the real interest rate on one affects investment demand on the other. And now, because of contractionary fiscal policy, the government is spending less but collecting more in taxes, which creates a government budget surplus. So surplus is the big word for crowding in. Deficit is the big word to let you know it's crowding out. And if they have a budget surplus, the government does not need to borrow as much as they did before, so demand for loanable funds would decrease. Or they could save more, supply of loanable funds would increase. Now AP might ask you either one. You know which one to move, if they say borrowing move demand, if they say saving move supply. I'm gonna just move supply this time to show you how it works. So the government is saving more because in a surplus they have more money to save. And because of this, real interest rates are driven down. Now, if you said demand decreases, real interest rates would also be driven down. And if real interest rates are driven down, gross private investment is driven up. Which remember, we're in contractionary fiscal policy. We're trying to fight a recession. What's happening to the eye of GDP? It's going up, the opposite intended effect of contractionary fiscal policy. This one's not as bad because at least long run economic growth isn't hurt, but still Keynesians still use it even though it's a problem because C is larger than I and because contractionary monetary policy, selling bonds, raising all the rates and ratio can help counteract this problem right here. So that's one of the biggest criticisms of fiscal policy. The last thing we're going to do with fiscal policy is the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve looks at a comparison of the aggregate model and I'm just going to look at the short run aggregate model right now and compare it to the short run Phillips curve. So this is short run Phillips curve is this a downward sloping line and it has the unemployment rate on the X, the inflation rate on the Y. And it's going to say very similar things to this graph. The only difference is it looks a little different when an aggregate demand shifts versus an aggregate supply shift as it did on the aggregate model graph. So with the Phillips curve, if aggregate demand increases, for example, expansionary fiscal and monetary policy, what we notice is that price levels and GDP both go up. And if GDP goes up, unemployment goes down. Now I need to show this inverse relationship where price levels go up, hence inflation goes up, and unemployment goes down on the Phillips curve. And I would do this as a movement up along the short run Phillips curve. So this is how I show an aggregate demand shift and how I also so show expansionary fiscal and monetary policy on the short run Phillips curve. Or, if aggregate demand goes down, we notice that price levels go down, GDP goes down, and unemployment goes up. And to show this again inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, I would move down along the Phillips curve. So this is how I would show contractionary fiscal and monetary policy. And this is also called the traditional Phillips curve because the traditional Phillips curve shows that classical idea that there's an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. 
this was disproved in the 1970s with stagflation. And at first they got rid of this graph, but then they quickly realized that they could show stagflation and an SRAS increase on the short run Phillips curve as well. So they adjusted the Phillips curve to show SRAS shifts. So again, I have my aggregate model. I'm just gonna look at short run again. And I have my short run Phillips curve, unemployment rate, inflation rate, and my short run Phillips curve. So now, if I wanted to show a negative supply shock, also known as stagflation, which would be caused by an increase in resource costs, I would shift my entire short run aggregate supply to the left, which creates inflation, hurts GDP, and increases unemployment. So I'm going to want to show both increasing on the Phillips curve. And to do this, I would shift the entire short run Phillips curve to the right. So this is saying the same thing, but it can be a little counterintuitive that a decrease in supply increases the short run Phillips curve. So make sure you slow down and really read what this graph is saying. Because usually an increase means a good thing. On this graph, increasing the short run Phillips curve is how we show stagflation, which is the worst thing an economy can have. But I could also show all good things by shifting the SRAS to the right, which is something caused by a decrease in resource costs or an increase in technology, which can lead to long-run economic growth. So to show this, I notice that inflation's going down, unemployment's going down, and the whole curve shifts inward, showing all good things by shifting it to the left. So remember, a short-run aggregate supply shift shifts the entire short-run Phillips curve in the opposite direction. Don't mix that up by going too fast. They move in the opposite direction. Aggregate demand shifts move along the short run Phillips curve. And then the last thing with the fiscal policy review is the long run Phillips curve. So on the AP exam, how you want to correctly label an economy on the Phillips curve is have both this short run line we've been talking about and the long run Phillips curve. Because this long run Phillips curve is synonymous with the long run aggregate supply, which shows that natural rate of unemployment. Remember that natural rate of unemployment is considered around 4 to 6 percent, so we'll say 5 percent unemployed. That means no cyclical, but we still have frictional, structural, and seasonal unemployment. And one thing we can do with this, just like the aggregate model in the PPC, is measure how the economy is doing. So I could say, just like on the aggregate model with the LRAS starting to the right of equilibrium, I could say that we're in a recession by having a point down along the short run Phillips curve. So this is how I would correctly label a recession on the short run Phillips curve. Or I could label inflation as a point up along the Phillips curve. And then on an AP question, let's say that like if you're experiencing a recession and the government increases spending or decreases taxes and it asks you to draw that change on the Phillips curve, this would be your first point and since it's an aggregate demand shift and moves along the line, this would be your second point. So that's how you show an aggregate demand shift from a recession to long run equilibrium. But the long run Phillips curve actually can move. It can move if there's a change in only one thing unemployment compensation. If unemployment compensation increases or decreases, that can affect this natural rate of unemployment because the idea is it will give people more or less incentive to get off government handouts and find a job. So it's a classical idea where they want people to be less dependent on unemployment compensation. So let's say the government increases unemployment compensation. Those who are frictionally unemployed and being picky about which job they choose have no incentive to get off unemployment. So this 5% is gonna to increase to like 7%. And that'll end up shifting the entire long run Phillips curve to the right. So an increase in unemployment compensation increases the long run Phillips curve. Or if the government cuts unemployment compensation, it would shift the long run Phillips curve to the left because now people have more incentive to get out there and find a job, and this 5% might fall to 3% as more people are out there finding a job. So then that is the Fiscal Policy AP Exam Review.